there was this one observation floating around the internet when Avengers Endgame released in 2019. Fans were juxtaposing this moment. A hero? Like you? You're a laboratory experiment, Rogers. Everything special about you came out of a bottle. With this. And this one. You're not the guy to make the sacrifice play. To lay down on a wire and let the other guy crawl over you. I think I would just cut the wire. With this. And I am Iron Man. But before we unpack why this juxtaposition bothered me, we have to go back in time a little bit. It's summer of 2019, a few weeks out from the release of Avengers Endgame. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is at the peak of its popularity, the general public is hyped. Endgame is set to conclude the then decade-spanning Infinity Saga, and to close the book on the original lineup of Avengers. As a tribute, Essayist Nando V Movies brings together a group of remarkable YouTubers to see if they can do something more, to each pick one scene from the MCU and talk about what it means to them, to the larger universe, to our culture as a whole. They called this project One Marvelous Scene. I wasn't making videos at the time then, but now, five years later, I am, so I figured why not jump on that playlist with a late entry and commemorate this particularly important anniversary? Here's what I was doing in 2019. I was living in LA with my two friends, all three of us freshly minted film school graduates trying to break into the industry. All three of us closely followed film YouTube as well. When the collab came out, we ran through that entire set of videos and picked personal favorites. But we also convened in our tiny living room and asked each other the question, what would be your one marvelous scene? Somehow, I knew mine right away. Is this the first time you lost a soldier? We are not soldiers. For me, this was the line that encapsulated the true fundamental tension between Iron Man and Captain America. It was not their petty back and forth about who was a better hero. It was this right here. Let's set the scene. Agent Coulson has just died. The film's villain, Loki, has escaped S.H.I.E.L.D. custody, and the Avengers have been split apart before they could even come together. It is the moment in the screenplay Blake Snyder calls the Dark Knight of the Soul, the hero's lowest point before we break into three. By the end of this scene, they will need to find some kind of resolve or idea that will help them fight back, that will ferry us into Act 3. In this moment, though, things are looking down. We are too. We slowly pan up to see Tony Stark gazing into the abyss. He's close to the camera, but his eyes are as distant as can be. Steve Rogers enters from the other side of the room. So far, the two characters have not been on the same page yet, but now, bonded by battle, perhaps they will be. Did Coulson have family? Tony answers offhandedly. Steve tries to be diplomatic, but this isn't the comfort his colleague is looking for. We cut between them on opposite sides of the frame. Tony's angry, he's volatile, he blames Coulson, but he also blames Loki, and he blames himself. He also staggers. Unable to complete... He was out of his league. You should've waited. You should've... Sometimes there isn't a way out, Tony. There is no guise of objectivity here. Tony Stark grew up rich and sheltered, and he is rich and sheltered even as a superhero. His powers come from a literal suit of armor. He never wanted this. Consider the blocking. The two characters meet in the middle of the room, and it's just as Tony crosses Steve that he whirls around. That look in Robert Downey Jr.'s eyes when he reads that line is so shell-shocked, so in denial, upset, precise. But for Steve, the fight is all he has left. It was in combat that he discovered himself. It was in combat he discovered his friends, only to eventually lose them. He's been here before. Chris Evans stands firm. The two characters are thesis and antithesis, but as they cross the room, we see them slowly start to see each other until they literally meet each other halfway. There's a duel between the cameras that resolves with them meeting too. Then we get the reveal. They're united in their mistrust of Nick Fury. Steve is ready to break protocol. Tony is ready to follow. Synthesis. This is the first moment when the most crucial relationship at the heart of these movies actually comes together. 
And then, epiphany, we break into act three. This is why it bothered me so much when Endgame came out some weeks later and this post started making the rounds. Like, I understand that this was a nitpick and didn't mean much in the grand scheme of things. I understood that the juxtaposition made sense and worked. But I also felt like it was incomplete. Steve Rogers and Tony Stark argue about being special and making the sacrifice play, but the conflict that this sets up is resolved within the very same movie. The Avengers 2012 culminates with the Battle of New York, in which Steve proves himself a leader, proves that his character is a greater superpower than his... well, superpower. It's why he was picked for the serum in the first place. Tony makes the sacrifice play by flying a nuclear warhead into a wormhole, knowing he might not make it back. There, he sees space for the first time. In this moment, he sees the universe. He sees the vastness and the cold, the stars indifferent. He sees also the bigger threat, battleships in the horizon. We are not soldiers, but we are all of us threatened by war. He loses communications, his vitals give out, and he plummets. That up there, that's, that's the end game. How are you guys planning on beating that? Together. Stark and Rogers earned each other's respect all the way back in 2012. Each proved their misconceptions about the other wrong within that movie. To disregard this is to insinuate that sacrifice as an end result is what matters. Sacrifice as an intent does not. I don't really like that. There was never any doubt that Steve had inner strength or that Tony would snap his fingers. The two's external conflict from here was resolved. Rather, the tension that did linger between them was a bit more internal, more ideological, more socio-political. When Tony Stark says we are not soldiers, he is deflecting. He and his family have profited from war, but the notion of actually participating in it terrifies him. This was his arc in the original film after being kidnapped by the Ten Rings, and he's dedicated the rest of his life to ensuring no one else is forced to pick up that gun, or worse still, fall under the crossfire. He has seen soldiers die. He's seen civilians too. Isn't that the mission? Isn't that the why we fight? So we can end the fight? So we get to go home? Every time someone tries to win a war before it starts, innocent people die. Every time. Tony's desire for a deterrent, a suit of armor around the world that will stave off war, period, is the catalyst for his and Steve's true conflict throughout the MCU, one that is not just indicative of his obsession with automation and desire to look away and distance himself, but also of his privilege. Because Steve is a veteran. He's lived through one of the greatest atrocities in world history and knows that war is not violence alone. It is also resistance, it is also oppression. To look away from that and leave the fighting and thinking to automation, automation trained on algorithms and an inequitable status quo, mind you, is to be complicit and uphold that status quo. And that status quo reeks of implicit bias. In this moment, Steve is a soldier, and he saw Coulson as one as well. When he asks if it's the first time Tony has seen one fall in battle, he's extending his own brand of admittedly hyper-masculine military man respect to Coulson. But he's also trying to do the same to Tony. That it doesn't fly is what's so fascinating to me about these two characters. Tony rejects this comfort, and rejects the notion that it can be seen as a comfort at all. It is not that he won't make the sacrifice play. He's done it back in the original Iron Man, and will do it again. But he doesn't care for the way in which we lionize it, glorify it. He questions the necessity of that play. Years later, Steve will get his happy ending only because he decides to question it too. Throughout the MCU, Tony and Steve are bonded as friends, rivals, almost brothers by way of Howard Stark. No, I'm glad Howard got married. Oh really, you two knew each other? He never mentioned that. Thousand times. God, I hate you. Colleagues, enemies, and most often, comrades. Across this whole gamut of relationships, they undergo a push and pull. Steve becomes disillusioned by the government, the military, the bureaucracy and hypocrisy of the American ideal. One that thanks veterans for their service, but too rarely offers them actual tangible support in their attempts to reassimilate. 
Tony is traumatized by all the war and suffering he sees as a hero, and grows to see the value of checks and balances, of accountability. He ceases to believe in war as a business, and, in fact, in the romanticization of it. They learn from each other, and adopt each other's beliefs and personality traits. But this also means they see their own worst tendencies in one another, or worse still, indulge the worst in themselves. Tony's obsession with policing causes him to lose sight of himself when he learns how his parents were killed. He became Iron Man out of a desire for redemption, but he sees no possibility of the same for Bucky Barnes, a veteran like those he hoped to protect, and Steve's last link to his soldier days. His definition of accountability and peace in our time is also xenophobic and deeply hypocritical. He uses the accords to keep Wanda under house arrest, and even makes a snide remark about her immigration status as if it makes her less trustworthy, but he's happy to defy the accords when it benefits him. Steve's disregard for accountability means he will always love the public and respect their criticisms, but never as much as he trusts his friends to rise, vaguely, above them. There was a time my friends and I would argue about which side of Marvel's Civil War we fell on. Of course, both sides are extremes, with the wrong asterisks attached. That's kind of what makes the debate more fun? Tony's take on bureaucracy is fascist, inconsistent, and hypocritical. Steve's take on freedom is interventionist and profoundly incurious. These are two of my favorite characters in the MCU, and it's these contradictions that make them such flawed and nuanced figures for me, more so than the basic archetypes they're typically associated with. We are not soldiers. Age of Ultron pays this off by showing us the consequences of Tony's PTSD hit their natural ceiling. You could have saved us. Steve's inability to move on from the battlefield twisted into an addiction. <laughs> Captain America. Pretending you could live without a war. Captain America Civil War sees these two characters adapting to each other's ideals, but not to each other's nuances. We are not soldiers, and this is the first moment they come together. As they cross the bridge, the camera duels between their perspectives, and then they meet, here. It is the first time they see each other and take each other's perspective. It is also, I think, where we glimpse how those perspectives might continue to clash. On a deeper level than the petty, who's the better hero? Is there a right way to be a hero? BS we've seen in Act 1. This is the scene that is reverberated in my head throughout the Infinity Saga, not the one about coming out of a bottle and the sacrifice play. In 2012, director Joss Whedon was known for his handle on dialogue and cadence, on character writing. Raised on Shakespeare, he had a particular love for flawed heroes who could quip and clap back. In more informal, modernized slang, of course but remained steadfast in their principles through all the cynicism. At the time, his voice was the perfect synergistic force for the Marvel project. While the third act is fun, so much of the joy of Avengers 2012 is in the build-up, the debate, the tension. And this is the natural culmination of that tension. Every word weighs heavy on every character. Now, it is important to acknowledge what we know about Whedon today, and I will, but I don't want to downplay his contributions or influence on the larger MCU here. I don't agree with the sentiment that his biggest influence was witty dialogue or quips. Joss Whedon is not the only reason we see so many witticisms in modern media, and to say he is gives him too much credit. Like most established filmmakers, he had certain beats, themes, and character archetypes he would keep circling back to that are, I argue, more important. Coulson's death here, for instance, slots into his legacy of killing off a certain kind of supporting character with a certain sudden nonchalance. Observed David Sims in 2014, he always goes for the cheap but effective kill, the cuddly character who everybody loves but isn't really crucial to the plot to raise the stakes. Admittedly, Whedon is a bit more mercenary in his finales, but his main leads almost always survive, racked with survivor's guilt. That guilt is exactly what he's tapping into here. Coulson's death is the catalyst for the Avengers coming together, but for no one more than Tony, who arguably knew him best, and Steve, who he unarguably looked up to. Whedon's shows also typically featured ensemble casts, composed of flawed people finding community with each other, and morally questionable bureaucracies that oversaw them from behind the curtain. We see all of these elements at play here. Cinematographer Seamus McGarvey is constrained from his usual flair by Whedon, 
but he does get to bust out one of the film's best looking shots in the scene just prior. I really like the low angle shots in this film. It's also worth noting that this was his first time filming on digital. He writes for RE News. Joss and I were keen on having a very visceral and naturalistic quality to the image. We wanted this to feel immersive and did not want a comic book look that might distance an audience with the engagement of the film. We moved the camera a lot on Steadicam, cranes, and on dollies to create kinetic images, and we chose angles that were dramatic, like low angles for heroic imagery. I also respect their choice to use a 1.85 to 1 aspect ratio, so as to capture more verticality during the Battle of New York and fit these titans of differing heights in the same frame. The slightly desaturated look this film has actually serves a similar function. Zero Wolf discusses this too in an excellent video about the MCU and color theory. I don't think the ugliness of Marvel movies is a factor of which ones are shot digitally. It's actually a factor of how many superheroes have to be on screen together. It helps keep their costumes, many of which are designed in loud primary colors, from visually clashing against one another too much. Even though Steve and Tony are out of costumes in We Are Not Soldiers, that neutral look here is consistent with the rest of the film and just as deliberate. Both of them are wearing muted clothes that will look pleasing next to one another while emphasizing different character traits. A graphic tee in line with Tony's character, and a stripped down blue uniform in line with Steve's. The scene is otherwise grey. Editors Jeffrey Ford and Lisa Lassig do an admirable job of cutting between those images with that same kinetic propulsion McGarvey mentioned. The camera movements, the frenetic editing becoming this visual push and pull between Steve and Tony, between stillness and anxiety, elevate Evans and Downey's chemistry to a level we hadn't seen yet. Once they join hands and decide to defy Fury, Tony's monologue leads into this perfect mid-sentence realization of where Loki will be, because our antagonist, it turns out, is more like him than he's been willing to admit. Loki's a showman. He doesn't just want to beat the Avengers, he wants spectacle. So do, do we, the audience. This was one of my favorite act breaks in the MCU, and it was, no exaggeration, one marvelous scene. Of course, this is what I might have told you in 2019. The reality is... Hey, it's been a while. As much as I would like to and have tried to speak from the perspective of my younger self, the MCU is in a different place than it once was. The studio is scrambling to get audiences as interested as they once were. We keep seeing vague reports about superhero fatigue and even more vague rambles about who's to blame for it. It's a lot. It would be disingenuous not to acknowledge that. The reality, as with all things, is more complicated. As Kevin Feige himself has admitted, they oversaturated the market. As no executives have admitted, the cost of that oversaturation has been the mistreatment of overworked editors and VFX artists, comic artists going uncredited and unrewarded for their original creations, and the emphasis of house style over unique directorial vision. There are still things I like or even connect with in all that chaos, and authorial voices that shine through in spite of it. More on that later. What's more relevant here is that my reading of the original Avengers has changed as any relationship with a work of art might, with time. For one thing, I find the overall movie to be less visually interesting than I once did. That's particularly true of this scene too. Don't get me wrong, The Avengers 2012 is still a high-octane field masterclass in spectacle and how to meld characters from different film genres together, but it is so by the strength of its characters, dialogue, and action, above its style, composition, and aesthetic ambition. Let's take our scene. The lighting and color grading is competent as with most of the film, but it's also flat. Functional. These shots are likewise functional in the edit, but that function, forward propulsion of the plot, is clearly more important to Whedon than the composition of each shot as a work of art unto itself. McGarvey discusses the challenge inherent with a blockbuster like this, of working with so much producer oversight and so many opinions you have to meet in the middle, in an interview with RTE. It tends to be you know, a cacophony of uh, 
of requirements, of, of uh, expectations, which can make it difficult because you feel that you're going one direction and suddenly you're having to be pulled another. So that, that's a challenge and that's more diplomacy than cinematography a lot of the time. I don't want to be redundant here. You've likely heard all this before. Criticisms of the MCU's approach to lighting and color grading are not uncommon. They've been around since its early days, they've gained traction, and become a vital part of the discourse in the time since. What I do want to focus on is the fact that these points have become so much more salient to me, and, if the internet is any indication, to the larger culture as a whole with time. I'm not interested in what Phase 4 has to say about superhero fatigue, but I am interested in the fact that average audiences, beyond critic circles, are finally taking a more critical approach to the movies that preceded it too. Why is that? Maybe those whys can help us dissect our scene better. Issue 1 I speculate part of it is Whedon's legacy, and now lack thereof. Joss Whedon has since been exposed for racial insensitivity on Justice League, controlling and misogynistic behavior on the set of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and just general verbal abuse towards his co-workers all around. When Ray Fisher approached him with concerns about how his character, the DCEU's first black superhero, was being handled, Whedon reportedly cut him off with, It feels like I'm taking notes right now, and I don't like taking notes from anybody. Not even Robert Downey Jr. It was a cartoonishly entitled thing to say, a line far more cringe-inducing from a real person than it might have been from one of his characters. It is also not nearly the worst thing he said. To be clear, I do not want this video to become about Whedon. I am not here to relitigate everything he's done. I've linked some recommended readings for that in the description. Consider Lila Shapiro's piece for New York Magazine, or Gita Jackson's excellent piece about his impact on nerd culture for Vice. What I do feel a need to do, though, is to discuss the Avengers with the full context of the artists involved in shaping it. Its director is naturally a massive part of that. It's often stated that Whedon's tenure in TV meant he held limited cinematic experience outside of the scripting stage, but I don't actually agree that this is why the film lacks flair. It is not a TV versus film effect, it is a Whedon effect. In their Vice piece, Jackson writes that Whedon has no particular visual style. Most of the time, the camera is invisible and unobtrusive. He rarely uses montage or juxtaposition or even visual metaphor to portray how characters are feeling. His camera is a distant, objective observer. And they're right. While there are exceptions to this, this is far from the norm, especially when it comes to Whedon's films. This is where the TV-film distinction can be more specific, I think. Film is a director's medium, whereas TV privileges the writers and the showrunners who oversee them for long periods of time. Whedon works best when he is familiar with a cast of characters and has worked with them before, because it's only then he bothers to capture their interiority in visual, unspoken ways. See the Buffy episode The Body for a standout depiction of this, or even the dream sequences in Age of Ultron three years later, when he's had some more time to work with this ensemble. In the original, though, we're shown a very omniscient, overarching view of the Avengers' grief. We understand Tony and Steve's states of mind here, but we don't burrow into how the grief has rattled their psyches. We hear about it. Infer. To tie us back, Indeed, it's the dialogue in We Are Not Soldiers that does so much of the heavy lifting. If there's a distinction I draw between my younger self and the one today, it's that in the past I would have said everything else is elevated by that dialogue. Today, I think it's all in service to it. This can be, and is, a valid and deliberate aesthetic choice. I bring this up though because while I do still love the overall Avengers 2012, I find myself with more complicated feelings regarding my specific scene. And that's because it is a scene that feels particularly beholden to Whedon. For all its strengths, it is shot entirely within his comfort zone. The dialogue is the star, and the direction is only here to complement that. In that very first argument, the one we all remember, when the Avengers quibble about noble heroics and sacrifice plays, the camera is, at least, playful. We see deliberate variation through close-ups and wides, there are Dutch angles to signify the character's descent into depravity, and even a great shot where the scene literally turns on its head while pulling back to Loki's scepter. 
In the Battle of New York, there are exploding particle effects and elegantly choreographed synergy moves between our main players while the world screams and rides around them. Alan Silvestri's score is on full blast. Here, there, almost every once and where, I see McGarvey's handle on the camera and Ford and Lassick's handiwork in the editing room. I see industrial light and magic, and the third floor's VFX work spark and erupt across the screen. I see the cinematic medium challenging Whedon to be more creative with the camera. But here, I see just him, at his most pared down and functional. I think we're past celebrating that without a critical eye. Of course, there were criticisms towards Whedon's work, even back then. Roger Ebert famously described the film's dialogue as speeches of noble banality, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer was frequently praised for its writing first and foremost, but less often its filmmaking. But there was a much louder, more vocal and passionate line of defense around him. He's too reliant on dialogue? He showed those naysayers with that masterful silent episode. There are sexist undertones in how he writes women? Well, he's actually a feminist who changed the game in the 90s. Today that defensiveness has thankfully been dispelled. With the context of all he's done and who he is as a person, we've become much more amenable to not just accepting critiques of his work, but also parroting those critiques. He was progressive for the 90s! So much of this reappraisal of Whedon's work, though, is precisely that. Reappraisal. To be clear, this more critical approach that we are taking towards it is absolutely a net positive. But it was a long road to get here. I think it's worth unpacking that when we talk about his body of work. Whedon built his empire on a culture of nerd worship, largely through acknowledging that fan interpretations of his works were just as important as his canonical intent, and he encouraged parasocial relationships, which left a lot of fans defensive about criticism towards his work. I am guilty of having been one of those fans. There's a difference between appreciating a director's body of work and advocating for creative freedom, versus deifying a director so as to shield any meaningful criticism around them. Maybe these lines have lost some of their luster now that one of the men who wrote them has too. On one level, that doesn't feel right. Why did it take until Whedon was quote-unquote exposed for me to start reevaluating his work? Issue 2. Maybe part of it is just my brain on film school. After Buffy, Firefly, and The Avengers, Whedon had become an influence on my work and the work of thousands of others. Not just creatively, but also scholarly. I used to even be a big fan of Dollhouse. Dollhouse! Do you know how many people have seen Dollhouse? As an undergraduate in 2014 through 2017, I learned about the world of Whedon Academia, an entire subculture in and of itself. His story spanned so many explorations of genre, gender, sociology, and class that there were multiple peer-reviewed journals, both graduate and undergraduate, dedicated to studying his work. One of my favorite teachers at the time, Professor David Kachemba, served as an editor-in-chief on one of them and penned foundational papers on the opening sequences of Buffy and Dollhouse. A friend of mine attending Wesleyan University surprised me by taking me to their film building. In a ring of concrete pavement around the base, rest carved inscriptions from the major artists who graduated from Wesleyan, Whedon naturally among them. His message reads, Watch something weird. It was genuinely inspiring to stand there. Later, I moved to LA in 2017, eager to break into the industry right at the height of the Me Too movement. I met some of my favorite people during that time, but also learned about the dark side of the industry in conjunction. I learned that many filmmakers and performers I'd once admired were terrible people. I learned that Hollywood was built on the backs of us, assistants and interns, and especially on the backs of women whose voices had been muted out for too long. I learned that the people I wanted to work with weren't necessarily the ones I thought of as my heroes. It was the people on the ground, my classmates, teachers, and co-workers. It was also around this time that Whedon took over for Zack Snyder and completed the theatrical cut of Justice League. Although the full extent of his abuse would not be made public until some years later, this time did prepare me for adopting a healthier approach to how I perceived my heroes, how I perceived Hollywood as a whole. See, the most natural way to get an entry-level job in the industry is to work at an agency or as an assistant to a larger player. You learn about those larger players fast, through the grapevine, who's good to work with, and who isn't. 
We didn't never came up in this capacity during my conversations with colleagues, but in the context of all I know about him and about the industry, both from my studies and all the info that's emerged after, it is particularly difficult for me to quote unquote separate the art from the artist. Nor do I think I should. Before 2019, I was a student who happened to have read a lot about the Avengers director and about the MCU that dominated the culture at the time. Nowadays, I'm a media literacy teacher who's noticed waves of incoming students who either call the MCU a major influence on their work or find themselves falling out of love with it. Sometimes both. We are fast approaching a world in which the emergent filmmakers of the time will have grown up with the MCU. They will adopt much of its worst qualities, its once muted craze, its avoidance of sincerity and over-reliance on bathos, its secrecy around scripts even in the hands of its talent, its implicit biases and military propaganda. They will adapt the worst impulses of the artists involved in making them, oftentimes subconsciously. At least, that's the fear that's easiest to reach for. Emergent filmmakers will also adopt, I think, some of the MCU's best. Its willingness to play with form as time goes on, its careful attention to casting and collaboration, its character work across projects. I also think that by recognizing its shortcomings, they'll look outwards to wider pools of inspiration. They will trace those influences back to before Marvel, beyond Hollywood. They'll look at the movies that purportedly influenced the MCU in the first place. I say this because I don't think my views on Whedon changed solely because he turned out to be a miserable person. It was also because my tastes naturally changed and developed with time. To quote the man himself, art isn't your pet. It's your kid. It grows up and talks back to you. Despite growing up as part of a generation that deified Whedon, I, and the vast majority of his fanbase, are able to examine his work with a more critical eye now. The fears I see touted against a younger generation raised on Marvel movies feel overstated to me. We can't blame people for growing up with the dominant pop culture of their time. We also can't forget that there is a sequel to growing up called Being Grown Up. I did not set out to make a video where I warn you about the dangers of parasocial relationships. But I did want to offer a reminder that our artistic influences never begin and end with any singular artist. It's by melding influences and looking beyond any one artist or one genre or one cultural context that we grow. I wish I had been more receptive to criticisms of Whedon's work in the past, but I don't regret my naivety around Hollywood or the early MCU as a project because without it, I wouldn't have gotten here. Beyond its director, that film I loved so much was a team effort, produced by Kevin Feige, co-written by Zach Penn, composed by the great Alan Silvestri, brought to life by an incredible team of VFX artists. Jeffrey Ford would continue to post-produce for the MCU well into Endgame, and be the one to suggest Tony's last line in the editing room. This was a movie that launched dozens of other movies, and also, spawned an IP-centric mentality that would confuse and set Hollywood back for years. But it is also, retroactively, made better by what its successors built on top of it. Whatever my complaints, I can say the same for this particular scene as well. Tony's declaration that they are not soldiers becomes all the more harrowing when he flies through that portal and sees Thanos' army. His PTSD becomes all the more resonant when Shane Black fully taps into it for Iron Man 3, when Whedon manifests it as his greatest fear in Age of Ultron, when the Russo brothers take it home with the moment he finally confronts Thanos, face to face. You're not the only one cursed with knowledge. My only curse is you. Despite their differences, both Steve and Tony's egos come to the forefront through all these experiences. One is so terrified by what he's seen, alone, he's sure that he has to be the one to stop it. One is so accustomed to what he's seen, he doesn't know how to picture a life beyond it. As with the comics, this was never a story about a boy scout versus a playboy. It was about a man with too much imagination, forced to see more than he could have imagined and crushed under the weight of infinity, and a man with too little, who was sure he'd seen it all, crushed under the weight of the future. 2012. We are not soldiers, but we are all of us threatened by war. Issue 3. 
to take us all the way back to the beginning. Does an old GIF set mashup from 2019 really warrant a full-length video response? Especially when so many of my criticisms have already been voiced before? Well, of course not. But I think that, to use the theme park ride metaphor, our impulse to gush over the peaks and the loops means we often overlook the rails, in a medium that is supposed to pay careful attention to its rails. I no longer feel the impetus for this should fall on the viewers alone. This is one place Marvel Studios films often fall short. They do spend time on slow character moments, but they don't always spend craft, style, and flair there. This is why projects like One Marvelous Scene are so important. I see these critical perspectives as the counterpoint to this issue, in-depth analyses that are about deepening our understanding of specific moments in these films, instead of just focusing on the broad strokes you pull up for the sizzle reel. Through deepening our understanding, we arrive at new perspectives. I mentioned that my friends and I picked personal favorites from the original One Marvelous Scene playlist way back when, and mine was Just Right's Military Ads in Marvel Movies. There, creator Sage Hayden unpacks the long-standing relationship between Hollywood and the US Department of Defense. Essentially, the Pentagon will provide military equipment for the shooting of a film in exchange for some creative control over it, including final script approval for how that film portrays the US military. While the MCU is often critical of bureaucracy, surveillance, and corruption in the government, you'll notice it is almost never specifically critical of these things within the modern US military. You'll notice one of the revisions Captain America Civil War makes to its source material is that the Superhuman Registration Act is enforced not by the US, but by the UN. I highly recommend Hayden's full video and have linked it below. This deal is a tremendous boon for big studios, and one that all three Iron Man films and Captain America films took advantage of, often portraying the military in a glorified light. But as Just Right points out, the Pentagon actually pulled their support from the Avengers 2012. Here's the quote. The military actually pulled their support from the first Avengers film because they felt that S.H.I.E.L.D.'s place in the national security apparatus was a little too vague. It's a transnational organization, so who answers to who exactly? It makes military organizations look shady, and the ambiguity in that messaging made the film into something the military did not want to be involved in. But they were back for Winter Soldier, and part of the reason is because S.H.I.E.L.D. is revealed to be secretly run by an evil Nazi conspiracy. Per Spencer Ackerman on Wired, the military stealth jets you see later on in the film were digitally inserted, and not actual planes provided by the US military. These factors give Tony's line a strange new meta-narrative weight. We are not soldiers. One I'm not sure Penn and Whedon intended. Comics have always been used to spread political messaging, or in Captain America's case, literally sell war bonds. But Tony is right. These characters are not soldiers. The way in which their films depict the military is romanticized and straight up signed off on by the Pentagon, and their cynicism towards corrupt governments and power structures, even when introduced as metaphors without explicit real-life analogs, is ironically more specific and interesting than their portrayals of actual existing institutions. Within the grander MCU project, The Avengers stands as the rare film that is not beholden to Pentagon oversight. Although my opinion of this scene has fallen in some ways, it's actually risen in others. I love that line of Tony's even more now. As I write this though, I find myself at a crossroads. Where does my own arc find me? What is my one marvelous scene today in 2024? Do I choose something post-Endgame so I can add something new to the works of my predecessors? Or do I lean on my own experiences, about becoming disillusioned by Hollywood? Should I choose a scene from Hawkeye, which tells a story about the flaws we fail to perceive in our heroes, and reckons with the cost of admiring those we don't know, often uncritically and without question? Or maybe, do I disregard the MCU altogether, and turn to my favorite Marvel film, which exists only tangentially to it? Maybe I just look at the universe as a whole, and turn to the scene that's affected me most. I know that road. I still think back to the fate of Tony Stark's parents, the way we seamlessly go from blurry cam footage to the character's internal flashbacks, realized in vivid HD and yet intimately, viscerally subjective in what they show and withhold. I think of the heartbreak, the handshake, the snap. And almost inextricably, that one line. Is this the first time you lost a soldier? We are not soldiers. 
Maybe I try to find something that combines the three, combines all the sides of me, fan, filmmaker, and critic, across time periods. I think my one marvelous scene, today and for the purposes of what I've talked about in this video, comes from Endgame itself. It's a single shot. A few minutes into the film, we see a close-up of Steve Rogers' eyes, staring into the horizon as he and the team fly off to space to confront Thanos. He sees too much scope, too much scale. It directly mirrors how Tony saw space for the first time in the 2012 film. I think, in this moment, Steve sees Tony's perspective for the past few years, meets him halfway just one more time, a little too late. He understands his fear and that crushing weight of infinity. We are not soldiers, but we are all of us threatened by war. What a terrible cost that's had, 